Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. Today we focus on the disturbing and distressing ethnic clashes in Manipur. They may have attracted headlines across the country, but do we truly understand what lies behind them? And do we appreciate how dangerous the situation can be as the potential to deteriorate further in Manipur remains, and also as the potential for the troubles to spread to other northeastern states remains? Joining me to discuss the situation is the well-known and highly regarded member of the Manipur Legislative Assembly, BJP MLA, Pawin Lal Haukip. Mr. Haukip, let's start with what's happened and is still happening in Manipur before we discuss what lies behind all of this and before we discuss the fear that the situation could either get worse or even spread to other northeastern states. Can you start by explaining to the audience as simply as possible, why are these ethnic clashes taking place? Well, Karen, uh, thank you for your time and interview. Uh, what's happened is a very unfortunate and a very uh, distressing, as you call it, uh, human, uh, inhuman violence. And... Uh, to most observers within the state, it is seen as an ethnic cleansing by the majority community uh, targeted on the cookies. Uh, as to why this is happening, uh, there is a long drawn build up behind this classes. And primarily, it is because of uh, the state government over the years. I'm not blaming only this particular government. The state governments over the years have neglected various provisions of the constitutions, uh, various provisions of the constitution that uh, you know provided for the rights of the tribals, whether it be on land and whether it be in administration. For example. The Hill Areas Committee, which is supposed to be, uh, you know, a kind of a mini administrative uh, uh, supervisor for the Hill Area Administration, has been rendered powerless. Uh, part of the blame, of course, goes to the uh, elected MLAs from the Hill Areas, but uh, a larger part of the blame also goes to the state governments over the years for neglecting uh, or denying the role of the, the Hill Areas Committee in the administration of the Hill Areas. For instance, when reserved forest or protected forest were declared or, or constituted in the Hill Areas, the Hill Areas Committee or the Standing Committee, which precedes the Hill Area Committee, was never consulted. So this kind of, uh, you know, uh, not following the constitution, this kind of negligence of provisions that provides for the rights of the tribals has been at the backdrop of tensions between the hill and the valley. 
And the first point was when this present government, uh, you know, had started. Uh, I will not, not call it the government per se, but uh, some leaders in the government and also some sections of society in the dominant media community had started building a narrative uh, targeting the cookies as poppy planters and cultures, illegal immigrants. Let's let's take this, Mr. So this kind of malign covenant. Let's take this, Mr. Haukip, step by step, so that audiences who are not familiar with the background can more readily understand the situation. I believe it was an order by the Manipur High Court, uploaded on the nineteenth of April, that sparked off the present troubles. Let's for a moment talk about that order. The court ordered the Manipur government to consider the inclusion of the Mete community in the scheduled tribe list expeditiously, preferably within a period of four weeks. But reports in all the Manipur papers have made clear that the High Court first of all made this decision without any tribal person or tribal organization knowing about it or being consulted. Secondly, your fellow BJP MLA, who's chairman of the Hill Area Committee, Dinganglang Gangame, has filed a petition in the Supreme Court to say that there is no proposal to include Metes in the scheduled tribe list pending with the central government, nor has such a proposal ever been sent by the state to the center. And then yesterday, the Chief Justice of India in the Open Supreme Court said that the High Court doesn't have the power to give such an order. So what do you make of this order from the Manipur High Court? Does it raise worrying questions? Uh, I'm sorry, I've lost you for some time there. But uh, let me uh, put this uh, straight. The classes were not caused by this court order. Let us be very clear. People just assume, the national media just assume that this court order is what caused the classes. It is not. The court order was there directing the government of Manipur to expedite its recommendations. Whether it is positive or negative is at the hands of the government. But what the court said was that they should expedite the matter. Now, that was that. And of course, the tribal bodies, the old tribal students union, Manipur, uh, are apprehensive that this drive of the majority community in Manipur to be included as serial tribe could end up challenging their tribal rights on land. So there was huge apprehension amongst the tribal communities and to show their displeasure or to show their concerns, they have organized on the 3rd of May a peaceful solidarity march, which went off peacefully, currents. That should be on record. It went off peacefully, but the radical uh, Mete organizations that have been nurtured by certain sections of uh, the Mete population have called a counter blockade. Whereas it was not a blockade, it was just a peaceful march. And they have called a counter blockade. And the night before the third, several processions were you know, organized as a countermeasure, uh, that kind of flared up patients in the valley also. And on the third, after the peaceful solidarity march had completed, I mean, have concluded, uh, people who have participated in the march, the solidarity march, went back home and they were picketed at the borders of the hill districts in Churachanpur, in Kangpokpi area. Uh, so, and these volunteers, the Arambai Tengol, as they call it, they started harassing those people. They started burning 
the can, vehicles. Can I interrupt? And that is what. Can, I, can I interrupt? Are you saying, Mr. Haukip, that the national media blaming the money for High Court is actually mistaken? This was a concerted and deliberate attack by Mete groups on the cookies because they were targeting the cookies. This has happened. Is that what you're saying? Because it sounds like that. I'm asking you to clarify. That is exactly what I'm saying, Karan. And it is not all the Metis. It is a radicalized group that has been nurtured by people in power over years. So is this a pogrom? Is this ethnic cleansing as some cookies are claiming it is? What is your view of it? It is an ethnic cleansing, clear and simple, Karan. Now, it, is a moment, it is a targeted cleansing. It is a targeted ethnic cleansing, and I would like to clarify here something else. The national media, without going to the going to the ground, just buys whatever is fed to them. They try to portray it as a Hindu Christian, uh, you know, right or something, which is not. It is not. I, I'll come to that if in a moment's time. If it were a Hindu time, Christian thing, I'll come to that in a moment's okay. time. Let's first explore why you call this ethnic cleansing. Your words were, this is targeted ethnic cleansing, clear and simple. Now, newspaper reports say that perhaps as many as 35,000 cookies at one point or another had to seek shelter in various camps, Manipur camps, uh, Assam rifle camps, army camps. Again, Although the chief minister has said only 60 deaths have taken place, unofficial reports say it could be as many as 100. And I'm told that these are 10 to 1 more cookie deaths than Mai Tai deaths. Is this why you believe this is ethnic cleansing? The not only because of the figures, Karan. All the cookie settlements within the Imphal Valley have been torched. And people are killed in the process. And on top of that, all cookie settlements that are bordering Meite districts like Bisnupur, Imphal West, Imphal East, they are targeted. Villages have been burned down. And the sad part is current. I'm very sorry to say this. But there are ground evidences of the Manipur police commandos protecting and making way for the Arambai Tingal volunteers. They are firing uh, tear gas at the Kuki villages. And once they retreat, the Arambai Tingal volunteers are allowed to carry out arson, loot, and whatnot. So this is really distressing, as you call, rightly call it. Sadly, Mr. Haukip, the line broke just as you finished your answer because at times the voice was weak and soft. Let me repeat the key points you made for the audience and you can then confirm I'm repeating them correctly. You said all Kuki settlements in the Imphal Valley have been torched. You said all Kuki settlements bordering Meitai districts have been targeted and villages burnt down. You said the Manipur police commandos have clearly taken sides against the Kukis. Have I repeated that correctly? Yes, Karl. So in other words, you cannot yes, rely on the objectivity and neutrality of Manipur police at the moment. That is what is scary, cookies. And that is what is keeping them, you know, uh, restless. When you cannot trust the state forces, who do you turn to? I can understand that problem. You are led into the state of despair. Let me take up the other point you were making, which is about how the clashes are being given a religious color. Now, I believe as many as 18 or 20 Kuki churches in the Imphal area have been destroyed. But so far, I'm told not a single Naga church, church has been touched. 
Is this a deliberate attempt to give the kooky Mete clashes a religious color? On the contrary, Karan, the very fact that only kooky churches are targeted shows that it is not a religious violence. It is a communal ethnic cleansing violence perpetrated by a section of the radical majority Mete community. Can you explain this to me, please, Mr. Haukip? Why are the Nagas not being targeted? After all, they are tribals like the Kukis. They are Christians like the Kukis. But as far as I know, they're not affected. How do you explain this? The Kukis are targeted. The Nagas are not. How do you explain that? Well, uh, I cannot really explain that. Uh, I can only surmise uh, on that, uh, Karan, uh, because... The current government in Manipur is in alliance with the Naga People's Front. That could be a factor. I don't know. I'm not sure. In other words, there is clearly some sort of political link that explains the fact that Nagas are not targeted to Kukiza. Yes, I would assume so. Do you believe that Hindutva forces from the mainland are behind this? I do not believe it and i do not not only not believe it but know for a fact that it is not a hindutva play no hindutva forces are involved it is just pure and simple ethnic violence carried out by a radical section of the mate population and this ethnic violence is directly being done you claim by metes against cookies it is strictly between the two, not the Nagas. Not the Nagas, Karen. In which case, let's... Karen, where Please carry on. Please carry on. Okay. Whereas the Solidarity March of 3rd of May was carried out by the All Tribal Students Union Manipur, which includes both the Nagas and the Kukis, when it comes to trouble and violence, it was only the cookies that got picked, that got targeted, that got, uh, you know, the houses torched, villages destroyed. So this is not a religious thing. It is clear and simple ethnic cleansing. And as you say, the Nagas are being excluded because of the political connections between the BJP and Naga parties in Nagaland. I mean that's uh, what I what I surmise. I'm not sure if that is the real reason. It is certainly a credible explanation. Otherwise, it's hard to account for the fact that Nagas are being excluded, even though Nagas are tribals like the Cookies and Nagas are Christians like the Cookies. Therefore, your surmise has a lot of credibility. I would assume. Well, I can only thank you for uh, believing what I surmised. <laughs> Let's come at this point, Mr. Haukip, to the role that many people believe is being played by Chief Minister Biren Singh. First of all, I'm told by people that for some months now, he's been using language to suggest that cookies are foreigners or even illegal immigrants, or they're encouraging and protecting illegal immigrants from across the border in Burma. He's been using language which has accused the cookies of involvement in drugs, trade and poppy cultivation. You alluded to that a moment ago in your first answer. He's even used language to suggest that cookies are trespassing on forest land. First of all, let me ask you, has the chief minister actually been saying or suggesting such things or is he wrongly accused? Which of the two? Those are on record, Karan. It's all on record. It is true that he's been leading the narrative of maligning the, the entire cookie community as poppy cultivators, as drug traf traffickers, as illegal immigrants from Burma. I mean, the, uh, as encroachers of forest land and if you give me some time, Karan, I'd like to explain each of these accusations in a little more detail. 
please go ahead first first the narrative that cookies are forest encroachers now there is a cookie custom wherein the lineage head of a clan is made the chief of a village and when the village is has grown to a certain size and when someone down the lineage uh, has a sizable population of his own lineage they are allowed to set up a new village within that uh, village land itself now that has led to uh, new certain new villages being set up and as far as the issue of uh, encroaching protected and reserved forest is concerned i have written to uh, the minister for environment and forest as well as the pccf of the state asking for details whether due procedure has been followed while constituting those reserved and protected forest i still have to have an answer on those because the 1927 indian forest act requires certain procedures to be followed when a government wants to constitute a particular area as a reserved or protected forest what are we saying what you're the, saying is that the chief that minister is, in ignorance of the way kuki villages grow and their kuki land policy has begun accusing kukis of land encroachment forest encroachment come to the point he's made about kukis being poppy cultivators and drug smugglers karan let me finish the previous point he has shown figures of the increase of number of villages in chorachanpur and linked that to the accusation that these are illegal immigrants from burma which is simply not the case the first reason i have explained it to you and the second reason is between 1992 and 1997 there were ethnic clashes between the kukis and the nagas and many villages in naga dominated districts had to relocate to chorachanpur or chandel and therefore the number of settlements growing in those districts these are not illegal immigrants there are some illegal immigrants or refugees i would like to i would rather prefer to call them because of the hunter take over in burma those are not even in thousands karan those are in hundreds and they don't set up villages they are being taken care of by their uh, uh, you know kins across the border so this kind of narrative which maligns an entire community from the head of the government uh, is very uh, distressing what about the claim that cookies are involved and, in drug smuggling and poppy cultivation i'll come to that yes there are indeed some areas where poppy is cultivated in the kuki districts but it is not only in the kuki districts that poppy is cultivated it is cultivated in the naga districts also but he chose not to pick on those he specifically chose to pick on whatever cultivation is going on in the kuki areas and current let me put this on record the people engaged in cultivation are mostly 99% daily wages falling into the trap of the lure of money big money offered by the big players and most of the big players are from the valley not from the hills so what you're saying if i've understood correctly is that the chief minister has deliberately misunderstood and therefore distorted the way kuki villages are planned and the way they naturally sometimes seem to expand he's deliberately distorted and misunderstood the fact that the kukis are sheltering kinsmen from across the border because of what the hunta is doing in myanmar these are refugees not illegal immigrants and similarly he's distorting the growth of poppies by cookies to make it seem that cookies are involved in drugs and drug smuggling whilst ignoring that poppies are also grown by nagas that is certainly your view and your position on what your own chief minister is doing 
I'm point, simply pointing out he is the chief minister of your party. Why is he doing this? Why is he targeting cookies? What is his motive? What is his agenda behind this? Uh, that I cannot speak for him, Karan. You'll have to ask him. But you must have some idea. Uh, uh, let me come back to the issue of protected forests and reserve forests, Karan. There's some very important thing that I need to highlight here. In November of 2022, the government of Manipur cancelled certain orders that were issued by the forest settlement officer way back in the 1980s, excluding the land of various villages, 38 villages, from the uh, proposed Churachanpur Khopum protected forest. And the grounds for cancellation were whimsical at best. One of the reasons given was that the forest settlement officer is the authority to decide those cases, but needs to be specifically empowered or uh, given authority by the state government. Now, the second justification given is Whereas the claims were submitted in 1971, the final were passed much later in the 1980s. Now, is that the fault of the village chiefs who submitted the pre-existing, I mean, the claims for pre-existing rights, or is it the uh, fault of the government for processing it late? I understand the point you're making, Mr. Orders? Hauke, but once again... When you say this has been done and done wrongly by the Manipur government, it means it's been done and done wrongly by Chief Minister Biren Singh. And this once again takes me back to that question you didn't want to answer. Why is your own Chief Minister targeting cookies? What is his agenda? What is his motive? Like I say, Karan, you'll have to ask him. I cannot fathom why the head of government would do such a thing. Then let me ask you this. Do you believe the Manipur government is handling the situation effectively or ineptly? It is It is the example, the best example of inept handling of anything. The rights broke out and it took more than 24 hours for the government to act, to represent the central forces. I mean, uh, it was allowed to, you know, go on uninterrupted. And like I said before, on the fringes, even the state forces were seen openly aiding the rioters, the mob. It is very saddening, Karan. Let me repeat your words. I asked you whether the state government was effectively or ineptly handling the situation. And your words were, I'm quoting you, it is the best example of inept handling of everything. Therefore, I want to now ask you, have you lost faith and trust in Mr. Biren Singh? Yes. I have lost faith in him, not in the party. I have not lost faith in the party, but I have lost faith in his leadership. In which case, is it time for president's rule? That is for the center to decide. I can only wish that there is some change in the way things are handled. And let me also tell you, Karan, the cookie community is unlikely because I'm in touch with the leaders. They are not likely to accept any talks or any settlement as long as Bahrain is in power. You're saying two very important things. The cookies are not likely to accept any talks as long as Birin Singh is in power. And the second important thing you said is, 
I can only wish there is change in the way things are handled. Would you, speaking personally for yourself, prefer President's rule at this point of time? Yes, uh, I would. Or if the central leadership can change the leader in the state, that is another option. So you would prefer president's rule or a change of chief minister? Which of the two is your first preference? Well, the change of leadership would heal a certain amount of uh, you know, anger in the state. And Karan, I'm in touch with friends within the Métis community also. And many of them don't like the way things are handled. Many of them squarely put the blame on the chief minister. The Let only me... thing is, they're oh, not yeah. speak up. They dare not speak up in the open. You're saying even sizable sections of the Métis community have lost faith and trust in Biran Singh? Yes, I'm saying that. But the explanation is that Birin Singh is supporting and acting on behalf of Metis, and you're saying many Metis have lost faith and trust in him. See, Karen, this revivalism of Metis Sanamahi, which is not Hinduism, is at the root of all this, uh, you know, communal uh, turn of things. And the Entire narrative is built by a few group of people, uh, uh, people in organizations called the Meite Lipun, leaders of which are in association with the chief minister. Can I put this to you, Mr. Hakim? The impression during the first term of Mr. Biren Singh was that he was a very different chief minister. He seemed to be reaching out to Kukis and Nagas, which is why he got re-elected. What has changed in the second term that he is now targeting Kukis? That you, one of the MLAs of his party, have lost faith in him. What is the change that's happened? In the previous term, Karan, it was a coalition government. And uh, there were, you know, pools from all sides. This time around, the BJP got 32 on its own. And the full now the center uh, in recognition of his contribution for bringing the party to power, gave him a second chance. And what he did thereafter, I am not in a position to explain why or how. Uh, but, Can I uh, ask you bluntly? Think... You're saying that after the BJP won 32 and came to power on its own, Biren Singh has begun to act and speak in very anti kooky terms. Is he anti kooky Does he have a prejudice against kooky in your eyes? Yes, honestly, yes, Karan. You're saying honestly, yes, he's anti cookie. Yes, even most, even many Maitis, uh, you know, confirm this. Okay, let me, since you are a BJP MLA, you are a member and a highly regarded member of the Manipur Legislative Assembly put to you a couple of questions from the other side as well. It's only fair that Maite grievances should also be put to you. To begin with, there are reports that Maites living in Kuki areas are not being allowed to leave because they are effectively held hostage to the ensure the safety of Kukis in Maite areas. Is that true? And do you approve of this tactic if it is true? Uh, when, uh, uh, when a communal flare-up like this happens, reason and rationale hardly works. It is the mob mentality, the anger, the frustration, the mistress that rules. Now, uh, if the cookies want a simultaneous 
uh, exchange of uh, stranded people in Imphal and those in Churachanpur, uh, I think uh, given the situation, uh, they they need to be understood and uh, simultaneously what's harm, what's so harmful and what's so uh, you know unjust in uh, wanting a simultaneous exchange. In other words, the Kukis are not holding Metis in Kuki areas hostage. They simply want a simultaneous exchange of Kukis and Metis from each other's territory. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. For mutual safety of those stranded, they only wanted simultaneous exchange. That's it. There is, of course, a bigger, far deeper and longer historical Mete grievance, which I want to put to you. The Metis are over 50% of the population, 53-54% of the population, but they cannot buy land outside the valley, which is only 10% of the state. In the remaining 90% of Manipur, which is hills, only tribals, which are Kukis and Naga, can own land. Yet the tribals can buy land in the valley. In Mete eyes, this is clearly an imbalance it seems and feels unfair to them. And many would say it does sound unfair as well. A, do you accept this is a genuine grievance? And B, if you do, how should it be rectified? Well, uh, Karan, uh, the land equation and the uh, the feeling of, uh, you know, uh, land pressure by the Maitais uh, is reasonable. But... Uh, we are a country governed by a constitution which protects the tribals and the land because the tribals have historically been, you know, uh, not in excess of uh, education. Uh, their economy is bad. I mean, so the constitution protected the tribals. Because if the land is taken away from them, everything would be gone about them. That is the positive discrimination that the constitution, the framers of the Indian constitution has kept. Now, today, if we're going to challenge the wisdom of our founding fathers, the framers of our uh, members of our constituent assembly, uh, it can be challenged everywhere and it will lead to chaos. Let me raise. So we two have questions. to observe what's given. Let me raise two questions. The Metes say, and this has been said by several Metes, it's also in articles they've written in the papers, that they were a scheduled tribe prior to merger with India in 1949. But when Manipur merged with India, they claim Kukis and Nagas got recognized as scheduled tribes. The Metes did not. In other words, this is an error made at the time of merger. How do you respond to that argument? Well, uh, there could be a, a technical possibility of Maitis being classified as tribe before uh, they merger to, into the Indian constitution. But like I say, we are governed by the constitution of India. And... Uh, what they were before they joined the Union of India is something else. But what they are recognized as after their merger into the Indian Constitution, uh, the Indian Union, should be governed by the Constitution. And furthermore, uh, the Maitis are, you know, a princely state uh, of, uh, you know, long-standing. They have great history of kings. Now, such a developed community wanting to become ST, uh, I mean, it's their democratic prerogative to demand it, but uh, I, I doubt if the criteria would be met. Okay. I'm not particularly against their demand. Let me put this. I'm to... not particularly. Sorry, carry on. Finish your sentence. I was saying I'm not particularly against their demand, but. Uh, uh, the majority of the tribal community feels threatened because they perceived it as a, you know, uh, uh, a way to uh, uh, encroach on the tribal lands that the constitution uh, has provided for its protection.
let me put this to you, Mr. Hauke. The audience will have heard your answer to this issue of the Maite hunger for land. You began by saying that the Maite request or demand for land is reasonable and understandable, but the problem is it's not permitted under the constitution because the 90% of the rest of Manipur is tribal area where only tribals can own land. So what you're saying, in effect, is that on the one hand, the Maite hunger or demand for land is understandable, but there is no solution to it. There is no way it can be provided because of the constitutional obstacle. That's what you're saying. It's reasonable, but there isn't an answer. Well, uh, I did not say there's no solution, Karan. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please carry on. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Please carry on. Yeah, yeah. You're not saying there's no yeah, solution. I did not what are you saying? Solution. If, if uh, the uh, the fact that the tribals are allowed to buy land in the valley is a problem to them, uh, we can examine that in the legislature and uh, restrict the tribals from buying land in the valley. Oh, that's very interesting. You don't want the metes to have the right to buy land in the hills, but you're quite happy to consider restricting tribals from buying land in the valley. That's what you're saying, aren't you? See, uh, the constitutional provisions for protection of tribal land has uh, a deep, you know, reason. The framers of the constitution debated days and days, days and months for protecting the interest of every Indian, the weakest sections, the tribals. Unfortunately, Mr. Hauke, the line and connection broke in the middle of your answer. So let me repeat my question and you give me your answer again. What you've said is that whilst the Mete hunger for land is understandable, the constitution does not permit that they can be given land in the hill areas because those are exclusively reserved for tribals. But what you're prepared to consider is a legislative bar or ban on tribals acquiring land in the valley. And therefore, the valley land will remain exclusively for the Maite. Have I summed you up correctly? Yes, correct. How many people will support this in your party? I don't know. Uh, this has never been discussed before. Uh, but uh, since you say that the Mete grows, the grows is that, well, uh, tribals can purchase land in the valley, well, they cannot in the hills. What I had in mind is that we can explore banning the tribals from acquiring land in the valley as well. Do you think your fellow cookies will support this? I'm not sure, but that's just an idea I have. So in other words, you're floating a personal idea. Is this the first time you've made this idea public? Yes, Karan. Thank you. So you've chosen this interview to make it public for the first time. Will you canvass for this? Will you campaign for it? Will you try and encourage people to agree with you? I mean, there would be no strong objection as far as the uh, uh, the, the, tribal, the tribals are concerned. I mean, the cookies are concerned. Because now, anyways, all the colonies in the Imphal Valley has been taught subjected to loot, arson, and many, not many, nobody would dare to leave there again. Okay, we're coming to the end of this interview. Let me ask you two questions about how you view the future. Over the last couple of days, curfew hours have been reduced, and for two, three hours a day, people have been allowed to go out, shop, and buy essential does that suggest that the situation is slowly but hopefully steadily improving? Or are you worried 
that because there are said to be more Mete groups with arms and weapons, like Mete Lipun, for example, and far fewer Kuki groups with arms and weapons, that there is a real potential for further deterioration in Manipur. Yeah, I am very apprehensive, Karan. How long will the central forces be able to stay there? Now, uh, if the state forces cannot be trusted and if the central forces cannot be staying there for too long, uh, there is every possibility of the ethnic cleansing beginning all over once again. So the real so, danger is when the central forces are withdrawn. The danger is when the central forces are withdrawn, what you call ethnic cleansing could start all over again. That is the apprehension, Karen. Given the close connection between the Mizos and the Kukis, and the concern publicly expressed by Chief Minister Zoram Thanga of Mizoram, is there a danger that the troubles could spread to other states? For example, the Mizo Zirlai Powell, the MZP, on the 30th of April issued a formal statement effectively threatening Maitai's living in Mizoram. Is there a danger that if the problem in Manipur isn't contained, it could spread to other states like Mizoram? Well, Karan, uh, the chances of it spreading to another state uh... It's hard to say at present, but uh, I would like to believe that it would not spread beyond the state because those Jirlai Paul, uh, what they have issued is just uh, a statement of displeasure over the way uh, the cookies are being treated in Manipur. And I don't think they really intend, uh, you know, uh, uh, vengeful action on the Maitis in Mizoram. And uh, the Mijos, uh, the Mijoram is a Christian state, and the church has a very uh, big role to play in the governance of the state. And I don't think they would allow any violence to happen to uh, my days in Mijoram. I hope you're right, Mr. Hauke, but if I recall from memory correctly the MZP statement, it said. And I'm saying this from memory, that if the situation continues the way it is, we won't be responsible for what happens to Maitis in Mizoram. That was an implied threat. Uh, I would not read it that way, Karan. Uh, what they're basically saying is, uh, if that kind of persecution of cookies continues in Manipur, uh, they are just saying that they will not protect or take care of Maitis in Manipur as they have been. It doesn't mean that they will act violent on that on them. English is subject to various interpretations, and uh, you know, time like this, people interpret whatever uh, whatever way they want. Okay, I accept that. I'm going to end there by pointing out. Some of the very important things you said, bearing in mind, you are a highly regarded BJP MLA of the Manipur Legislative Assembly. You said this is the best example. Before, of that, before that, Karen, if, may, if I may interrupt, before you conclude, I want to put some things into perspective. Uh, you keep on saying that I am a BJP MLA and... Uh, uh, speaking against the chief minister of BJP government. For me, uh, these are violations of the constitution. And as a party member, it is my duty to uphold the constitution. It is an odd that I have taken. So I don't consider it as anti-party. I don't consider it as anti-national. I don't consider it communal. I am only standing up for constitutional provisions and it is because those constitutional provisions were neglected that this kind of tensions arose over the years and 
Mr. Those Hawkins, of the neck like I the was actually going to applaud you for the courage for actually speaking critically of your chief minister and of your government. I was applauding you for that honesty when you made that clarification, and that clarification is very well taken. It is very rare for a legislator to have the courage to criticize his chief minister and his own government, but you've done that. And I want to applaud you, I think, and I hope others will also get courage from you and do that nationwide. Legislatures are supposed to speak up and say the truth, not worry about party discipline. See, uh, the party is not above the constitution, Karan, and uh, nothing is above national interest. So the moment the constitution gets violated, I have taken a note in the assembly that I will uphold the constitution. And it is my duty to point out whatever I the constitution that, Mr. has been violated. The line is once again fracturing. I hope it lasts just for one minute more so I can point out, you believe that the handling of the situation in Manipur by the Manipur government is the best example of inept handling of everything. You believe that, in fact, the chief minister, Mr. Biran Singh, is anti kooky He's prejudiced. And you say many Mai Thais would confirm this. You say you would prefer a change in leadership. You have lost faith in Biran Singh, but not in the BJP. And you would prefer a change in leadership, otherwise, president's rule. That is a very outspoken, courageous set of statements you've made. And I applaud you for having done so publicly. People in politics should learn from you the need to be open and honest. Thank you very much indeed. It's an honor speaking to you, Karan. You are the media idol that I have. Thank you very much indeed for those kind words. Thank you, sir. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.